All right, thanks, Michael. I think that was an excellent presentation and kind of a good segue. Let's make sure that uh, you guys can see me. First things first. How's that? Coming through? Coming through. Fantastic. So uh, thank you so much for letting me present uh, this project. Um, I'm Gene WB9COY. And there's a group of, of enthusiasts in, in San Diego that I work with. Um, I'll give them credit in the next slide. Uh, so the purpose of this project was to actually uh, add, add a picture capability to the RS-41. There's the other picture capability out there. Uh, but I wanted to actually use the native RS-41 zoned itself and just add, excuse me, just add a camera to it. So uh, I've been successful. And the picture you see right now is actually a, uh, a picture that came from an RS-41 that we launched a couple of weeks ago. So we're, we're getting pretty good results. Um, it's taken a little time to get these results. And I, I, I consider the payload just barely out of out of alpha or actually beta. We've had several successful launches where nothing's crashed and everything worked. Uh, the actual last two launches were, were pretty good. And I will actually show pictures from those launches in this presentation. So credits got to go to uh, Phil Karn, KA9Q. I think you guys know Phil. Uh, Jim McLaughlin, KI6ZUM. Randy uh, Stanky. Uh, KQ6RS and David White, WD6DRI. This is the group of folks that I work with in San Diego. Uh, we've been working together for well over 10 years. And, you know, I, I got to blame Phil Karn for all this. Uh, prior to this, we were launching payloads that were probably more traditional uh, and more expensive, obviously, and really heartbreaking to lose. So Phil injected this sound. Uh, technology into our group and it's been incredibly successful if we lose a payload we're not too concerned uh, and it also there's a group of chasers now that have formed uh, Randy kind of heads up the chase team Randy's an avid hiker has a four he bought a four-wheel drive I think just to go out and chase some of these things so um, we're we're well equipped to uh, uh, keep going with this hobby in this area all right, a little system overview. Um, so the sound itself, um, we're in the UHF band 434.5 is a frequency we're on. Uh, it seems to work for us. And we've monitored that, that channel for a long time and it looks like it's a, a clear path for us. Uh, we add a camera to the actual sound, modulation schemes, uh, GFSK, Gaussian frequency shift keen, 9600 baud. Uh, and just an incredibly simple overview. Uh, the protocol actually for the camera is we, we transmit a start. Uh, and that start is kind of a header message that tells us how big the JPEG is going to be. And then once we know how big it's going to be and we know the MTU, the maximum transmission unit, we do simple division and we can break up the payload into, um, I call them pigeonholes, array indexes, uh, I, I now know uh, how to, I know, I know the, the, how many pigeonholes is going to be and each pigeon, pigeonhole gets a sequence number. So after start, we send the sequence data, which is sequence one, which is 64 bytes, 64 bytes into end of payload, which is image stop. Uh, I do protect the image start and the image stop with uh, Reed Solomon codes. Um, these are very important because without these, we really can't do much. We need to know start and stop. Um, but I was not able to protect the sequence data because uh, just too much latency in the RS-41. Uh, but with uh, several ground stations now uh, monitoring, we're getting some fantastic results where um, the Reed Solomon stuff on the sequence data, um, maybe we're okay. Results kind of prove it. Um, so we're getting pictures back down to the ground about once every minute, 45 seconds for a JPEG. And uh, I'll show you some of the JPEGs later on. So several ground stations using um, uh, hardware that I'll, I'll show you later on. Uh, what comes out of the ground stations is not really a JPEG, it's the image sequence data. So the, the, it's the P 
pieces parts of the JPEG come to back to the ground in each ground station. And those all are hooked up uh, into the internet to a server. Uh, and the server aggregates all these. So based on the header information, the start the image start, the aggregator knows how big, how many pigeonholes I have. And each sequence number slides into those pigeonholes. And at the end, uh, it's, it's able to build the JPEG. So if ground station one miss, missed a sequence one, but ground station four got sequence one, it would fill in the pigeonhole. And then the users are able to uh, view the JPEG pictures through the internet, a little cloud there. Let's see. All right. So a little bit about the payload. So uh, um, we've talked about a little bit about this. I've seen this uh, in the past, but you know, SI-432, and we're putting it in GFSK mode. Um, and then the power output's been um, measured and verified by Randy as 16.3 dBm. Uh, the centerpiece is the STM uh, F100 ARM CPU and a SPI interface uh, between the CPU and the SI-432. Uh, everything goes over the SPI interface. So the U-Block GPS data through the UART, this is internal. So there's nothing external about this is all you know, on the board. So you blocks to a UART, UART over the SPI. So we're embedding and not embedding, but we're um, transmitting GPS packets along with the uh, picture data, along with the battery voltage data, along with the temperature data. All this is kind of intermixed with packet IDs. And then the camera, the kind of the centerpiece of this um, presentation, look it up to a UART and that's external. So the camera's hooked up to the external UART, and I've got a picture of, of that over here on the back. And I think Michael's covered, covered some of these pinouts over here. In the back of the RS-41, uh, we get the UART connections, RXTX, so we get battery, and we get ground. Um, so the power that we use to, for the camera is the 3.3 volt pin. I've tried to use the five volt pin, but the five volt pin is a boost and it cannot sync enough current for the camera. So we have to use the lower voltages uh, and that makes the, finding the camera a little bit harder. So we haven't, we don't, there's not a lot of camera selections out there, um, but what we got, I'll give you a link to that later on is uh, something we can buy for 21 bucks. A little bit about the pinouts on the arm, um, just, FYI's, oops, FYI's. Thank you. Um, we can see the MOSIs and the MISIs, the clock and the radio signals, all this stuff. Uh, actually, this I did this build from scratch using the STM Cube IDE. I, I, this was, I don't know if you guys have an experience with this, but it's an Eclipse based IDE that comes from STM, very, very uh, good tool. So if any developers out there, um, this hint that the STM has an excellent IDE, uh, the cube, and you start with this particular chip and then you add, you add functionality to it. And then the HAL is built for you. Um, so you see in the source code, I'm using the, the HAL generation, it kind of sped the development up quite a bit. Um, for the, the software. All right, the camera connections. So here's our camera. Um, the camera comes with a header already on it. So I just desoldered it. So it's the, the desoldered form of the camera. And then this a two millimeter connector. Now this is a little more uncommon. Uh, and so I gave a link to where you can buy these connectors on DigiKey. So it starts out as a um, 10 pin uh, ribbon cable. And then I just strip away the, the ribbons I don't need. And the RS-41 shell itself, I do a little carve out. Let me get close up of that. So I kind of carve out a little area, just enough to get the camera in there, poke a hole to get the lens out. And then uh, 
there's enough recess in that carving to actually the board will just lay right over it. The flight form of this, I actually have a piece of duct tape that goes over this to kind of protect it from shorting out. So there's the camera mounted in the RS-41. There's the connector that would just snap on the back of the board. And Michael had a great picture of the board so you can reference his presentation for that. And so uh, here's what it looks like when it's kind of put together. The board just lays right on top of the camera and then we simply connect it. So there's um, an easily, easy on, easy off. Uh, and then that's the, the kind of, that's what it all put together. A small little hole for the camera. And then kind of a back view, um, just FYI. It, there's the connectors that they, they fit very nicely into this case. So it took me a little while, a little head scratching of how, you know, how am I gonna get the camera in there? We had some uh, people who actually print up uh, maybe a little, uh, it was a, a holder that would kind of strap on the side of this thing. But um, I just stared at this thing for a while and had a Eureka. I said, Why don't I just tr try to put it in there with a little recess and it worked. So there it is, it's, it's all in one. Um, so the San Diego group, we don't get so, so bummed out anymore if we lose the payload. We got 21 bucks into the, the camera. Um, the gas money to go out and retrieve these things. Uh, but we're getting a lot, a lot more student participa participation because we're launching more. Now, um, we do, a, the, the, the typical launch is a dual payload, one using four FSK at the top of the string. string. And then uh, Randy's come up with a, uh, through experimentation, a 50 foot leader on the end of the balloon to kind of uh, guard against a lot of uh, sway. So with 50 feet, um, we're getting pretty good stability with, with the camera below it. So we lodged two payloads, one for FSK, which we do all the tracking with. And then we have the camera payload just below on that string. So we're, we're typically launching two zones at once. There is the ground station. Uh, you probably guys, uh, so this is uh, Uptronics. Um, they're into the LoRa business because it's RF-98 chip, but the RF-98 chip also does GFSK. So I just programmed this to run GFSK instead of LoRa. Um, once upon a time, the San Diego group was concentrated on LoRa um, using the, the PIT software but then um, it had, we, it, the payloads were still expensive. And if we lost them, it was, what well, was me? But because of Phil Karn and his discovery of radio zones, um, we're not so concerned about losing the payloads, uh, but we're not using LoRa. We're using the GFSK mode of this, this chip. So it fits on top of a Pi Zero. Um, Randy has put several, um, stations up on mountaintops. In fact, Randy's incredible. He actually goes up, he designed these antenna. Randy's an antenna master. He designed antennas also with preamps on them. And uh, just to note to the group, there's gonna be an AMSAT article uh, that'll be coming up in a couple of months that will describe all of the work uh, that the San Diego, San Diego group has done. Um, so we've, we've got Raspberry Pi 4s running on the mountaintops. Uh, and we're, we're getting, uh, Randy's getting excellent results on the 4FSK side, tracking these things to the ground, keeps kind of a spreadsheet and then uh, goes out and hikes and, and enjoys retrieving these things. So 